So hello friends, this is going to be our third section in the unity of religion. Uh, up to this point we've looked at different aspects of the unity of religion. One that Baha'i faith actually proposes that there will be one common faith, and that at the same time it does not abrogate, belittle, or attempt to distort the original teachings of these previous expressions of God's love and guidance to humankind. Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, etc. We then looked at how uh, this claim can often sound very odd, <laughs> um, and yet at the same time this cannot be a means for brushing off the claim, but rather that the Baha'is are inviting people to an independent investigation of the original intent and purpose of these revelations of God to humankind. Uh, we definitely empathize with the oddity of this claim. Uh, we looked at a quote from One Common Faith, a work put forward by the, uh, if you will, the, the World Center of the Baha'i Faith, where it says that the Baha'is should understand that this appears to do violence to the facts, that Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam seem at variance with each other. They seem to teach things that are very different. But that rather this should be seen by Baha'is, one, is understandable, and two, an, invest, an invitation, if you will, to actually look at these different revelations in their historical context and within the evolutionary context of Baha'u'llah's writings and his revelation. Dear friends, thank you for joining us. Um, please note that this is only a personal interpretation of the Baha'i teachings. If you wish to have an authoritative stance, please go to Baha'i.org. I want to thank the Baha'i administration, all those working in their neighborhoods, and anyone who is trying to work for the betterment of the world. Please note that in the description below you'll be able to find an MP3 version of this, so you don't have to watch it, um, but also a PDF of all the quotes that will be used in any of the deepenings, and timestamps of the different sections. And please subscribe if you'd like to be alerted for any upcoming videos. Now, today we're going to be looking at what I call avenues of approach, meaning if we are going to actually look at these revelations and try to see how they might have one underlying reality, like the various colors of the spectrum, or for example, the manifold ways that electrons, protons, and neutrons manifest themselves within the physical world. Um, what are these avenues of approach that we can take? The first I often call textual empiricism, uh, with there are several sub-principles in it, and it is this. We have these scriptures. Um, we are not bound by the historical interpretive process that has been foot put forward by these traditions. And this is often uh, jarring to individuals who actually come from other traditions, say from Buddhism or Christianity. Because the response will really be, but that, that, that's not Christianity. Um, yet, this quote from Abdu'l-Baha uh, might shed some light on it. But when we speak of religion, we mean the essential foundation or reality of religion, not the dogmas and blind imitations which have gradually encrusted it, and which are the cause of the decline and effacement of a nation. These are inevitably destructive and a menace and hindrance to a nation's life. So in this quote, uh, Abdu'l-Baha is saying that these divine religions, which were revealed from God to humankind, have become gradually encrusted. If you will, it's as if we pulled something out of the earth in an archaeological dig, and we're looking at it. We understand this is a man-made artifact, or for example, a dinosaur bone. But we actually have to scrape it and dust it off in an attempt to understand what it actually means. There is another aspect of this which is that I am, well, me and not you, and I have to go through the process of independent investigation and be honest about what I'm doing and do the best I can to understand this revelation on its own terms. How that's often seen, say for example a Buddhist, is that, well, the understanding of that interpretation, of that scripture, sorry, on its own terms means understanding it as Buddhists from my denomination understand it. Forgetting for the fact that there are various, various different denominations of Buddhism. Same with Christianity or Islam. It's really this principle of free interpretation, which is 
under, if you will, the principle of textual empiricism. Um, I am supposed to be doing my best to understand what is biblical, if I'm studying the Bible. What is Quranic, if I'm attempting to understand the Quran. Trying to understand what, for example, the Mahayana or Theravadan scriptures are saying, but making sure that I'm not necessarily simply taking the interpretations that have come to me through this denomination or sect. Um, so we have to separate, if you will, the text and the interpretation. And it's quite jarring often, and I think most of us who have actually, if you will, worked within trying to understand even our own scripture, um, or scriptures of other faiths, is that people often have a very difficult time separating their understanding of what a text says and the text itself. I've very often been sitting with someone, they're like, but it just says X. And I would say, well, I understand that that's how you understand that text. <laughs> that this is actually, for example, how your tradition or your communion, your group, understand that text. But it isn't necessarily what the text says. That's actually an interpretation of it. And I don't read it that way. Uh, in the future, we'll go into more and more examples of this. But for now, it's really um, to say that, well, the Bible teaches... Well, there's, a very, there's varied understandings, manifold understandings and interpretations of these texts. Now, this principle of free interpretation and textual empiricism may sound like we're just trying to get you know, out of a, <laughs> a difficult problem. And this is something that almost every individual of these traditions will understand. If I myself am raised within a Catholic society, and some societies are and have been extremely Catholic, what is my Protestant friend going to be asking me to do? They're going to ask me to do an independent investigation of the New Testament free from the historical momentum of interpretation and dogma that is actually enshrined within Catholic doctrine and try to see this revelation in the empirical form of its actual text with fresh eyes. Uh, this would be the same with two individuals who have very, very different perspectives, for example, on Vedantic Hinduism. They're going to be doing what? Asking each other to actually go back and actually investigate, say, the Upanishads, to try and understand anew what this is actually saying. And there are principles that, if you will, also connect to this, which is that um, many of these works use the same themes, the same motifs, the same words and concepts over and over and over again. This would be the principle of internal definition. If I wish to understand, for example, what the New Testament means by fruit. Jesus Christ says that there are good trees and bad trees, good, which have good fruit and bad fruit. And um, he uses this as an analogy for true and false prophets, and you're supposed to test them. If I want to understand what fruit means, while I have a free interpretation, there is the textual empiricism. I can actually go to the scripture itself to understand how that term is used. And this is not in any way remotely solely connected to religious texts. I can actually go into the works of Karl Marx, one of the originators of communism, and he uses a phrase, false consciousness. And I can actually look into his works in all the places that he uses that term to have a better understanding of what Karl Marx means by false consciousness. This is actually what it would be mean to be textually empirical related to the writings of Karl Marx. So if I want to understand what for example, the word news in the Quran means, uh, I can look up all the places that that is actually used. If I want to understand what, for example, Richard Dawkins means by selfish uh, in the selfish gene, given that genes can't have motivations, I would do what? I would go through all the works of Richard Dawkins to try to understand what he means by that term or by that symbol, or by that motif. And this goes for anything. If you want to understand what wine means in the writings of Rumi, you can actually do an investigation of that, an independent investigation. And this isn't actually limited to English translations. 
Um, we have a principle of original languages. If I want to understand what fruit means within the New Testament, there are tons of websites and search engines and Greek concordances and Arabic concordances for the Quran where I can actually look into them to try to understand, well, how many times is this Greek root used? How many different permutations of that root? Now, are they all, if you will, truly, truly related to each other? And then investigate what it means. Now, we will see in a future video that when we actually look at, a, say, a passage in the Quran that says, uh, if a wicked man comes to you with news, look into it carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. Well, I can take almost every single word within that phrase if I want to understand what that ayat or that verse of the Quran means. And I can actually look at, well, when he says, if a wicked man comes to you with news, what is that word news? What, what does it mean? I can even look at the Arabic root and see how many different forms of it are used in the Qur'an, and allow, like the writings of Karl Marx with false consciousness, allow the Qur'an to self-define. Of course, then, I can always actually look at the great minds of Islam. I can actually investigate what people have said. I can try to understand what a Shia thinks that means, or what a Sunni thinks that means. I can do this with the Catholic, the Protestant, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, I can really delve in if I wish to truly understand this, and there are a great many resources and avenues of approach that I have before me. The second principle, or great principle, meta-principle, is progressive revelation. This is a fundamental tenet of the Baha'i Faith, that we, when we're looking at the different religions of God, are looking at a universal religious belief that is, if you will, many fountains fed from one source. But the progressive aspect is, is that there is an evolutionary context. The most commonly actually addressed is the evolutionary context of the different social teachings that we find within each revelation. We're going to add a principle to that that I will suggest, but for now, let's look at some of the writings of the central figures. That the diverse communions of the earth and the manifold systems of religious belief should never be allowed to foster the feelings of animosity amongst men is in this day of the essence of the faith of God and his religion. These principles and laws, these firmly established and mighty systems, have proceeded from one source and are the rays of one light. That they differ one from another is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the ages in which they were promulgated. Gird up the loins of your endeavor, O people of Baha, that haply the tumult of religious dissension and strife that agitateth the peoples of the earth may be stilled, that every trace of it may be completely obli obliterated. For the love of God and them that serve him, arise to aid this most sublime and momentous revelation. Religious fanaticism and hatred are a world-devouring fire, whose violence none can quench. The hand of divine power can alone deliver mankind from this desolating affliction. So in this quote from the Green Gleanings of the Writings of Baha'u'llah, it brings out a really heartfelt principle, really I think from almost all humankind. We may at times try to avert our gaze from it if we come from any religious dispensation or even of a non-religious dispensation because of the horrible things that have been perpetrated within the names of various belief systems. That, there, that religious fanaticism and hatred are a world-devouring fire. They have torn apart the body politic. And I say that this isn't solely... Uh, within the religious domain, because when we look at actually, uh, if you sorry to put it, but the body count of actual communistic and atheistic ideologies, it, it is atrocious. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that that is a false belief, like any other belief system. The issue here is, is that the essence of the faith of God, according to this quote of Baha'u'llah, is that these are rays of one light, and that religious differences, no matter if someone agrees or disagrees, should never be allowed to foster dissension. 
uh, we will look at this in the future in the principle of the unity of religion, that actually the Baha'i writings actually state that it would be better if you were not religious, if that religious devotion is going to bring up within you a desire to harm another person or hate another individual. Um, the principle at the very end of this quote uh, is something we should really take stock of as Baha'is and as non-Baha'is who might be uh, watching this, why, why Baha'is are so, uh, if you will, <laughs> intense regarding this issue of religious unity from a Baha'i perspective. It is that religious fanaticism uh, cannot be quenched just by political agreements, merely by socially getting together. That this is a fire that can only be quenched by the hand of divine power through the healing remedy of the social and spiritual teachings of the Baha'i Faith in this day. This next quote is from Abdu Baha. The world of humanity may be likened to the individual man himself. It has its illness and ailments. A patient must be diagnosed by a skillful physician. The prophets of God are the real physicians. In whatever age or time they appear, they prescribe for human conditions. They know the sicknesses. They discover the hidden sources of disease and indicate the necessary remedy. Whosoever is healed by that remedy finds eternal health. For instance, in the day of Jesus Christ, the world of humanity was afflicted with various ailments. Jesus Christ was the real physician. He appeared, recognized the symptoms, and prescribed the real remedy. What was that remedy? It was his revealed teaching, especially applicable to that age. Later on, many new ailments and disorders appeared in the body politic. The world became sick. Other severe mal maladies appeared especially in the peninsula of Arabia. God manifested Muhammad there. He came and prescribed for the conditions so that the Arabs became healthy, strong, and viral in that time. So here, Abdu Baha uses uh, explicitly the analogy of the manifestations of God as physicians, divine physicians who come into this world with a mission and a charge from God to actually diagnose the problems and prescribe the remedy. That the revelation from God unto mankind that appeared in the time of Jesus Christ through that holy temple of the prophet of Galilee uh, was meant for that age and were especially applicable to that age and that this is the same with each of the manifestations of God. That the varying conditions that you see within the revelations of, say, Islam or Buddhism have some relationship to the evolutionary context and what mankind had to hear and the medicine that they needed to take in that era. I would add that, and this is something we're going to look at more and more as time goes on, that this isn't solely the social teachings of that revelation unto humankind. Uh, an analogy I often use is, um, most people know the idea, for example, of a dead metaphor. Uh, in fact, dead metaphor, <laughs> the phrase, is itself a dead metaphor. It is that oftentimes <laughs> symbolic communication can, used to convey an idea loses its symbolic nature. Um, when I say dead metaphor, you don't think immediately of something having died. Just like when I say if you understand, you don't see it as, as standing under something. That the, the, <laughs> the expressions of the divine physicians, when they attempt to actually convey a principle of the divine world unto humankind, are forced really to actually communicate this within physical language, within what Abdu'l-Bah calls sensible language. That at times, these teachings, our ears become deaf to them. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, we become deaf and blind to the actual light 
the, the ideas and concepts that are behind those images so that they need to be renewed in a new receptacle so that humankind can actually once again drink of those teachings. Um, this is the concept where in the New Testament it says, you do not pour new wine into old wineskins, or thereby you ruin both. Problems arise where followers of one of the world's faiths prove unable to distinguish between its eternal and transitory features. An attempt to impose on society rules of behavior that have long since accomplished their purpose. The principle is fundamental to an understanding of religion's social role. The remedy the world needeth in its present-day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require, Baha'u'llah points out. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in, and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. In this quote from the World Center, from the work One Common Faith, uh, we find a principle that I think is not discussed enough within the Baha'i communities and shared with non-Baha'is alike. And it is the source often of a confusion that I find um, that arises between myself and, and friends of the faith and friends, of, friends and family alike. It is that when I understand the unity of religion, and I believe that, for example, Christianity was a divinely revealed religion, as was Islam or Buddhism or Zoroastrianism, this in no way means that I believe that that revelation is applicable to today. That I am anxiously concerned with the age, the needs of the age in which I live, and I recognize, for example, that the imposition of social rules and behaviors deriving from the Quran actually will cause problems to arise. <laughs> and have caused problems to arise. That I do not believe by any means, for example, that the social injunctions and teachings within the Torah, the core of the Jewish scriptures, are actually supposed to be used today. No, they were actually revealed in the age in which they were revealed and were meant to guide humankind for a time. And that if we are unable to acknowledge this difference between the eternal and transitory features of any revelation, that problems are going to arise because we're going to attempt to uh, impose on society rules that have long since accomplished their purpose. And you think of this, if I myself am, say, an Orthodox Jew, and I believe that, you know, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures themselves, have been revealed by God to humankind to guide them, a real intense cognitive dissonance begins to arise. Because how can I then go back and begin to edit them? If I really believe they're divine, and this is something that uh, atheists and secularists have brought up for a long time, like, you're, you're saying this is divine, and now you want to, yeah, but you know, this doesn't fit, and this is like, no, there's no way we should do that. Um, there's a cognitive dissonance that arises here because you, know, you believe this is divine. So, of course, you're going to want to have it as the guiding principle of your nation and potentially nations. Um, same thing with a Muslim or a Zoroastrian or a Buddhist or a Hindu. When you're looking at it, you believe this to be divine revelation, and at the same time, you, you, you can't then state, well, then I shouldn't impose these rules on society. No, you actually believe those are the, the rules that God revealed for the imposition to be imposed on society. This is the, the challenge that we're actually facing as a globe. We have to be able to discern between that which was revealed by the divine physician for the ailments of society and then the age in which that manifestation of God came and differentiate between its eternal and transitory features. And obviously the challenge is psychologically that once this occurs, then you think, well, how can it possibly be that things have changed so much that they're actually need, that these principles revealed by the divine world no longer apply? Then what do apply? Well, what happens is, is you actually begin to look around and see if something else has been revealed. This is, if you will, the pressure cooker of investigation that actually causes the, the heart and soul to begin to long for a new divine message. This is the principle of the evolutionary teachings 
enshrined within every revelation. There is one uh, other quick aspect of this I have to address. Um, when I claim to believe in the divine origins of Christianity, one of the greatest difficulties I have in communicating how I see the world to uh, friends and family is that it means to them that I, they hear, if you will, that I believe what Christians believe. At the same time, that usually is actually pared down from Christians, and when they say Christians, they mean Catholics. But even when it's Catholics, it might not be real academic and intelligent Catholicism, which exists and is beautiful. It's what my friend actually believes who happens to be Catholic. It's like when someone asks me as a Baha'i, and I've had this happen, they'll say, well, do you believe in heaven and hell? And I'll say, well, it, it depends what you mean by that. No, 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 just answer the question, yes or no, do you believe in heaven or hell? The challenge is, is that in their mind is a full meaning of that term. They believe hell means something and heaven means something. They might mean something like a lake of fire and torture, literal and physical, and sitting on clouds playing a harp to be really cheesy. So if I answer yes, then automatically they're going to think that's what I believe. And that belief system, which is their belief system about the meaning of heaven and hell, gets ascribed to me. Um, this is often what happens with the unity of religion. It will be that, well, if I say I actually believe Islam is a divinely revealed religion, that actually means that Rob, A, believes the social teachings of the Quran should be applied to today, and B, believes what my Sunni friend tells me Islam believes. That is not the case. It is that they are a divine fountain that was revealed by a divine physician in that age according to its sociological, epistemological, even linguistic and spiritual context. That is the unity of religion. O thou seeker after truth, the world of the kingdom is one world. The only difference is that spring returneth over and over again, and setteth up a great new commotion throughout all created things. Then plain and hillside come alive, and trees turn delicately green, and leaves, blossoms, and fruit come forth in beauty infinite and tender. Wherefore the dispensations of past ages are intimately connected with those that follow them. Indeed, they are one and the same, but as the world groweth, so doth the light, so doth the downpour of heavenly grace and then the day star shineth out in noonday splendor. O thou seeker after the kingdom, every divine manifestation is the very life of the world, and the skilled physician of each ailing soul. The world of man is sick, and that competent physician knoweth the cure, arising as he doth with teachings, counsels, and admonishments that are the remedy for every pain, the healing balm to every wound. It is certain that the wise physician can diagnose his patient's needs at any season and apply the cure. Wherefore, relate thou the teachings of the Abha beauty to the urgent needs of this present day, and thou wilt see that they provide an instant remedy for the ailing body of the world. Indeed, they are the elixir that bringeth eternal health. In the beginning of this passage, from Abdu Baha, there are a host of issues that arise. One is that the, the, the Baha'i faith believes that a new revelation is like a divine springtime, that it is bringing back the freshness and the beauty and the life of a previous spring. In addition to that, that these revelations from a Baha'i perspective, or from this Baha'i's perspective of the Baha'i faith, um, are themselves not some disparate, uh, you know, if you will, pulses of light at different times, that they are in some way intimately connected with each other, and that to be able to see how they are intimately connected, there is to, if you will, perceive of it as if you're looking at different members of a family, or different members of a larger community, which all live in, say, one village, and that this is a divine physician going around and treating the ailments and the sickness of this or that soul. Uh, as well, it's stating that actually these teachings are themselves 
the, if you will, the health and balm for the suffering of an individual, an individual psyche, an individual heart, an individual mind, and enables them to live a life of purpose and serve humanity in the best way possible. And it is this that we are the people are being asked here by Abdul Baha to look at the cure proposed by Baha'u'llah and to see how they actually address the urgent needs of the present, because you can see that they are the remedy for the ailing body of the soul. So just as the previous revelations can be understood in many of their facets to have been remedies given to the human body politic in order to heal and can cause damage if applied now, but also that's how we can see that these are, if you will, intimately connected to each other. This is a way of testing the claims of Baha'u'llah in this day. The passage continues. The treatment ordered by wise physicians of the past and by those that follow after is not one and the same. Rather does it depend on what aileth the patient. And although the remedy may change, the aim is always to bring the patient back to health. In the dispensations gone before, the feeble body of the world could not withstand a rigorous or powerful cure. For this reason did Christ say, I have yet many things to say unto you, matters needing to be told, but ye cannot bear to hear them now. Howbeit when that comforting spirit whom the Father will send shall come, he will make plain unto you the truth. Therefore, in this age of splendors, teachings once limited to the few are made available to all, that the mercy of the Lord may embrace both East and West, that the oneness of the world of humanity may appear in its full beauty, and that the dazzling rays of reality may flood the realm of the mind with light. In this final section of a quote from Abdu'l Baha in paragraphs 3 and 4, it addresses this issue of the Divine Physician and saying that although the remedy may change, it is to be defined by its functional purpose, to bring humankind back to health, to take a patient who is sick and heal them. And this is that why we can see that the language and expressions and communications of the Divine Physician seem different on the surface. But if we look at the aim and purpose and function of the remedy and see how what it's a trying to address within the patient itself, we can begin to see that it is a medicine, that it is truly the teachings for that error, and that these teachings are actually growing in intensity as the human body politic becomes healthier. Once it falls back into ill health, because it has become older, I can use a medicine that is more strong, that can actually be applied to that patient that when they were younger they could not have taken. These principles and laws, these firmly established and mighty systems, Baha'u'llah asserts, have proceeded from one source and are the rays of one light. That they differ one from another is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the ages in which they were promulgated. To argue, therefore, that differences of regulations, observances, and other practices constitute any significant objection to the idea of revealed religion's essential oneness is to miss the purpose that these prescriptions served. More seriously, it misses the fundamental distinction between the eternal and the transitory features of religion's function. The essential message of religion is immutable. It is, in Baha'u'llah's words, the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. Its role in opening the way for the soul to enter into an ever more mature relationship with its Creator, and in endowing it with an ever greater measure of moral autonomy, in disciplining the animal impulses of human nature, is not at all irreconcilable with its providing auxiliary guidance that enhances the process of civilization building. 
So in this quote from Uncommon Faith, it states that there are three distinctions here that are going on. The first is that in the revelations of God as they come throughout time in a progressive revelation, mankind is enabled to have a more mature relationship with their Creator. Secondly, an ever greater measure of moral autonomy, an ability to, if you will, bring the animal impulses of humanity under control to an ever greater degree. And that this is not at all irreconcilable with providing auxiliary guidance on the plane of the social world in order to build up civilization. So therefore, to actually state that these religions on the case of social teachings, cannot actually be one and the same because their social teachings differ, cannot seriously be considered an objection to the religious a unity underlying them, the divine unity underlying them. And that I would propose once again that having the expression of divine truths revealed in various different languages and ways of communication, if the underlying principles themselves are one and the same, or if you will, different facets of that same truth, also cannot be said to be an objection to the unity of religion. I, we know that human communication, when expressed in different literal languages, can have the same meaning. I can say, like, uh, I don't know, say, un sag buzurge, that dog is big. And then I say it in English, and the idea underlying it is actually the same, and yet at the same time, none of the sounds, none of the physical manifestations of that sentence are identical. I can then translate that sentence into thousands and thousands and thousands of different languages, thousands and thousands of different scripts, even scripts that I myself make up. But the propositional content, the idea that unites them is one, and yet their physical manifestations through languages and scripts and carvings and interpretive dance, if I wanted to do so, would actually be radically, radically different. This is the same in my understanding with the religions of our world. Yes, things are actually communicated in different ways. The concept of sacrifice might actually be expressed in one case in the willingness of Jesus Christ to sacrifice himself for humankind. But we might find that, for example, in the actual willingness, for example, of the Imam Hussein in Shia Islam to sacrifice himself. We might find principles of salvation which seem on the surface to be radically different to be one and the same in their propositional content because we're looking past, if you will, the vow, what is called often the valley of names or the veil of names and look to the underlying meaning and purpose of what it is. And once again, if we find the remedy to be causing the health and development of the psyche and of the body politic, that is the purpose of the divine physician. They are all remedies. There is a subset of this teaching of progressive revelation um, which are the principles of relative progress and what I call the principle of indulgence. It is that a social concept may take a relative degree of progress and that to decry a teacher um, for having to teach a three-year-old simple or concepts is unjust. Once again, this is the concept of the evolutionary context. If we wish to understand what a revelation was attempting to do, we then have to place it back within the 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 evolutionary context that it was revealed in. Well, look at this first quote. At the stages of social development at which all of the major faiths came into existence, scriptural guidance sought primarily to civilize, to the extent possible, relationships resulting from intractable historical circumstances. It needs little insight to appreciate that clinging to primitive norms in the present day would defeat the very purpose of religion's patient cultivation of moral sense. This quote from Uncommon Faith is saying that the revelations revealed by God to humankind were seeking to civilize, to the extent possible, humankind. And that, yet at the same time, clinging to these prior norms, and it uses the term primitive, primitive norms, would defeat the very purpose of religion's patient cultivation of the moral capacity of humankind. That when we actually begin to look at these prior religions, this is the principle that has come up before, that 
clinging to some of the more primitive norms causes detriment to the body politic because it's as if you have a, a, a physician grabbing a, a medicine that is meant for something radically different and giving it to a patient simply because it worked over here. In this case, it's actually that this medicine when given to this patient will actually cause sickness. This does not mean from a Baha'i perspective, or from a Baha'i's perspective, that this medicine was not perfect for that time, or that it was a patient, if you will, elevation and raising up of humankind. It's that it is only when we look at, for example, the teachings of the Quran, or the teachings of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, or the New Testament within their social context, that we can begin to truly understand what they were attempting to do. That this actually is necessary for someone to truly understand these revelations, or else you look at something and you say, well, how could this possibly be from God? Um, this is immoral. Well, it is from our perspective. If I actually look at, I say, a parent who is attempting to get a child to like not punch someone else when they want a toy, um, to think that actually the communication don't punch someone when you want something, is actually primitive. It is primitive. This isn't the patient moral cultivation of a child. There are very many things that you actually have to teach children that in order to actually bring them into maturity, in order to bring them into adulthood, yes, you speak to them of nobility and justice and compassion and mercy. You give them the vocabulary of high ideals, but at the same time, you actually have to teach them things that if you saw in any adult, you would be phoning the place. <laughs> so it's important to understand this metaphor that the Baha'i Faith uses of the cultivating of one individual, humankind, from their infancy all the way up to what we believe to be our current adolescent stage, that we can now move into maturity. Um, I had, would like to say that I think that any honest student of religion can actually see this if we're being really, really honest about the different dispensations. How can we understand the New Testament's relationship to the institution of slavery? Um, would that have really have been the last word in the New Testament? It is telling slaves to be kind to their masters and masters to be kind to their slaves and to realize that they are actually all one in Christ. But it never actually comes out and decries the actual institution of slavery. It is talking about how a master should see his slave and a slave see and serve his master. Um, does this mean that we are actually to allow slavery in this day? Same thing goes for the Quran and the actual Torah. No, it's that actually the ailment of the eradication, in my understanding, of the principle and institution of slavery really, really, truly needed humankind to be able to see, in spite of social standing, that this individual is their ontological or existential equal. That that is actually what was the remedy necessary for that time. And to come out and actually attack Christianity because it did not address the institution of slavery might be a misunderstanding of what it was attempting to do, and what it was attempting to build. This actually brings us actually to what I call the principle of indulgence. And it's basically that religions may even ignore, or say may ignore, or even indulge specific undesirable traits as they're trying to remedy other more serious issues. This actually comes from a quote in One Common Faith. Among the most contentious of such issues in understanding society's evolution towards spiritual maturity has been that of crime and punishment. While different in detail and degree, the penalties prescribed by most sacred texts for acts of violence against either the common weal or the rights of other individuals tended to be harsh. Moreover, they frequently extended to permitting retaliation against the offenders by the injured parties or by members of their families. In the perspective of history, however, one may reasonably ask what practical alternatives existed. 
in the absence not merely of present-day programs of behavioral modification, but even of recourse to such coercive options as prisons and policing agencies. Religion's concern was to impress indelibly on general consciousness the moral unacceptability and practical costs of conduct whose effect would otherwise have been to demoralize efforts as social progress. The whole of civilization has since been the beneficiary, and it would be less than honest not to acknowledge the fact. So this principle of relative progress here is being applied, and even of the principle of indulgence, to the issue of crime and punishment. That yes, when we look into the early revelations, we find uh, punishments for certain crimes to be somewhat harsh. And then it says, but what practical alternatives existed? There were no uh, prison systems or no current uh, behavioral modification. And it says here that it was attempting to impress two things upon the consciousness of humankind. One was the unacceptability and even the practical costs of the acting out in certain ways. This in some sense is just like evolutionary psychology and evolutionary morality. The, the religions of God are trying to do these two different ways, these two different facets. One is the spiritual, if you will, ontological existence of a moral order that actually carries someone forward in the absence of the practical costs, but also the practical costs that come along with breaking the moral sphere. These two different, if you will, engines to carry forward society. Uh, this is a very, very important principle, I think. We'll see more and more as we go forward into understanding the Baha'i Faith. That it doesn't leave just the ideal and just, if you will, the, uh, the existence of a moral order. No, there is actually injunctions for civilization building that actually have reward and punishment built in. It's just that if we leave only the practical costs or the practical benefits to an action to be the guide, then actually we lose almost all of which is truly glorious about the capacity of humankind for moral action. I don't want people to avoid, um, say, stealing because they might get caught by the police. Or they might get shamed by someone who is their family member or friend. No, we want individuals to have indelibly imprinted on them the moral unacceptability. Both of these are going on but it's placing within the evolutionary context that we are really looking at when we're looking at the Jewish faith, or the Christian faith, or the Buddhist faith, or the Islamic faith. We have to remember that their world was not at all like our world. Their context, evolutionarily, was not ours. So it has been throughout all of the religious dispensations whose origins have survived in written records. Medicancy, slavery, autocracy, conquest, ethnic prejudices, and other undesirable features of social interactions have gone unchallenged or been explicitly indulged as religions sought to achieve reformations of behavior that were considered more immediately essential at given stages in the advance of civilization. To condemn religion because any one of its excessive dispensations failed to address the whole range of social wrongs would be to ignore everything that has been learned about the nature of human development. Inevitably, anachronistic thinking of this kind must also create severe psychological handicaps in appreciating and facing the requirements of one's own time. This is a very intense and heavy quote uh, within the work on common faith from the Baha'i World Center. So it says, when we look at the written records of surviving revel revelations, we actually find things like mendicancy, slavery, autocracy conquest, ethnic prejudices, and other undesirable features of social interactions. And it says, and it's very important to focus on this, have gone unchallenged or been explicitly indulged. So unchallenged means they're not addressed, 
But the other aspect is, no, they were actually put within a context. They were actually utilized in the process of building up civilization. Or in some sense, the revelations might say, just go ahead. So don't worry about that right now. Let's focus on this, right? And this sounds quite shocking when you begin to think of it. And yet at the same time, I think the more you think of it, the more sense it actually begins to make. It is attempting, religions are attempting to heal humanity. And if we take this issue of health and the divine physician once again into the forefront of our minds, we can see that this actually does apply. Imagine yourself as a divine physician, sorry, as a physician, and you walk into a room and you see an individual that has been injured. I myself, I'm a first aid responder. So I actually look at this individual and I see a host of ailments, a host of injuries that this individual has. What do I have to do immediately? Should I start looking at all of them or randomly moving around, just fixing whatever comes to my attention first? No, I actually have to diagnose the patient and see, in my case, is their airway clear, right? Do they have massive bleeding? Is their circulation are okay? Are they in a state of shock? It is only once these begin to address that I can actually move to other issues. Because if I actually begin to address, say, a broken toe or damage to the shin and this individual is not breathing, I actually send them to their doom. So if an individual is saying to me, but look at his leg, look at his leg, and I actually have to ask, assess his airway to see if he's actually a getting air and then breathing and then whether or not it's labored, I actually, I would have to tell this individual to be quiet. You have to be silent. Let me do what I'm doing. And this is so when we're actually dealing with a series of beings that actually truly do have free will in a very real sense. We are allowed, we're not controlled like robots by the divine. We are allowed to actually drive our own car and sail our own ship. And we get into some very, very sticky situations. This is what's saying that as religion sought to achieve reformations of behavior that were considered more immediately essential at given stages in the advance of civilization. So for example, I'm just using an example from the here at the beginning. If you actually have issues of mendicancy, of wandering individuals who are begging, and that is not something that is desirable, but you actually make it structured, if you will, if you actually put supports around it while it's still allowed to go, it looks like you're, you're indulging it. I'm not saying I agree with it, but for example, safe injection sites currently in our culture is actually an, an, a, a principle of actually trying to put strat structures around a really, I would say, an evil, <laughs> profoundly evil act and highly detrimental to society and the individuals in order to actually safeguard them. I'm not saying that it's actually identical or that I even agree with it currently. It's simply that this is a principle we understand. Um, I have dealt with friends throughout my life who have actually battled with addiction. I battled with addiction myself when I was a younger man. and. When you are actually battling with such things, if I was to walk up to you and you were addicted to methamphetamines or you're addicted to opioids, and at the same time you're addicted to sugar and you're addicted to smoking, I would really suggest that you don't walk up, that no one walk up to you and say that you should focus on quitting smoking. You're actually taking methamphetamines or opioids. It is about addressing, just like the airway and the breathing and the massive external internal bleeding of an individual, that's what you have to focus on. What is the real serious issues that can then bring that patient back closer and closer to health? This is the principle of indulgence. Another sub-principle here is the relative context of philosophical and theological teachings. I've, hit, I've suggested this multiple times so far throughout the session, and it is simply that as, um, in a recent quote we just read, we are trying to develop a more mature and deeper relationship of humankind with his creator, that is, a deeper and richer understanding of the divine world. That actually, as we begin to understand more about the world, 
we see as we look back behind us in time that that new and richer and more developed and more sophisticated understanding of really anything, be it history, mathematics, biology, sociology, or theology, or the anthropology, the nature of the human soul, etc., is is actually founded upon prior simpler notions and understandings. Again, I am a father uh, of two wonderful children, and I am attempting to take these individuals who are currently only eight and six years old and make them world citizens who understand their global home and actually see all these different revelations of God and all these different belief systems as expressions of human striving towards the good. Uh, I actually do this with my children. Does that mean that I talk to them as I might talk to dear friends or individuals of my own age? No. I actually have to take that, pare it down into much, much, and much more simpler principles to be able to communicate to them, which in some sense at times have to obscure some of the complexity and sophistication of my own real worldview. Uh, that's the nature of philosophical and theological teachings, of understanding what the purpose of human existence is, what the nature of God's messengers are, what the nature of God is itself, what the nature of the world is. When we're looking back at some of the dispensations of these revelations that constitute the religious tapestry of humankind, sometimes we're going back 3,000 to 4,000 years. And we have to understand that and really understand that that's actually what we're looking at. That this has been a patient cultivation, not merely of the individual moral autonomy, not merely <clears throat> of the social teachings, but also of the philosophical and conceptual understandings, the epistemological status of humankind. That this has been a patient cultivation, and sometimes within those worlds, because there are more pertinent issues at hand for the divine physician to diagnose and treat that sometimes other things are left alone. Another aspect of this principle of the evolutionary context and the progressive revelation is what is often used in the Baha'i writings as the seasons of religion. It is that every religious dispensation when it comes into this world is a divine springtime, coming on the heels, if you will, of a winter. Then that new revelation, say it be Judaism or Zoroastrianism, for example, comes in and it brings life and purpose to humankind. The world is clothed with new meaning, new concepts, new ideas, and new understandings. And new social teachings meant to carry forward that civilization. It then actually flowers into a summer that is rich and buzzing with life. And then it yields the fruits of its harvest in the fall. That that which is brought in, the real maturity of the heart and mind of that civilization, through the inspiration of that divine gardener, then actually gives fruit. But then the cold wind set in. And then a process of decline actually occurs, and this is which begins to stir in human hearts and minds the desire for a deeper understanding, which then comes in a due divine springtime. But what are the implications of this? It's that when we look at revelations, when we look at dispensations, using Zoroastrianism as an example, that we should be tr seeing them within a natural process of composition and decomposition, of growth and decay, so that we can see that, yes, this is actual decay. This is actually where the divine teachings, the, the social teachings, for example, are no longer addressing the issues and the needs of humankind. They actually can now begin to actually cause, if you will, a pressure upon humankind, which has to be remedied by the next divine manifestation of God. And this is the process, if you will, of flexing and unflexing of the human spirit. That this is actually how growth happens. So when I look at another religion, to see that there was a stage of decay is a natural process for me as a Baha'i. Oh, and this, sorry, and this also addresses the issue of why these teachings, which once had their purpose, and which were, were once beneficial to humankind, can now begin to cause damage. It's as if you're trying to bring in the, the, the if you will, the vegetation of winter into spring. Yes, they are what gives 
the foundation for the new life of the new spring. As they compost within the soil, they do give their life. They are reborn in the new spring. But to go back and actually apply them now is where problems arise. As next principle, um, I often call the principle of symbolism and refer to as the Valley of Names. It is simply, it's been addressed momentarily before, which is that different faiths use different symbols for the same concept. And they often use language that is jarring to individuals from a previous dispensation. Uh, so we have to be able to look below the symbol, beyond the symbol itself, to understand the underlying principles that it's attempting to convey. Um, and look at the functionalism, if you will, of is this actually healing? Is this actually giving forward something that is actually to awaken humankind, intellectually and spiritually and socially, to a new understanding of divine, the relationship between the divine, between their own moral autonomy, and the process of civilization building. Here in the principle of symbolism, we take some things that like, very often can actually cause shock to people. Um, and sometimes if we're in that community, we don't really have a sense of how shocking or jarring some of these principles might have been. Um, when we look, again, it's a very intense example, at the uh, uh, Christianity in the New Testament, and it's reaching out to the Jewish community. In the Gospel of John in chapter 6, uh, I believe 666, um, John, oh, sorry, Jesus actually says to the Jews that they should uh, drink of his blood and eat his flesh. And often in the Western Christian context, this doesn't sound odd, but until you remember that this is Jesus, a Jew, talking to Jewish people who have kosher food laws, and are not allowed to drink blood, let alone eat human flesh. And this actually, we see in the context, actually upsets not just merely the Jews themselves, but actually upsets Christ's disciples. Um, and this is something that when a Jewish individual would hear, this would be jarring. This is the principle of the Divine Assayer we'll look at more deeply in the future. But for now, it's... Is that really what Jesus Christ was saying? Is that really what he meant to eat human flesh and drink human blood? No, of course not. Um, he's actually trying to convey a spiritual truth through a, I would suggest, a rather jarring <laughs> uh, symbolic form. Um, but there's other aspects of this, the valley of names that can cause us to, if you will, have the underlying principle or meaning veiled. Um, I lived in Asia for several years. And oftentimes when you go to a Buddhist temple, you will see these grand paintings, some of them exquisite, and others, coming from a Western context, uh, it looks like I'm looking at demons. Uh, some of the, the Buddhist creatures, if you will, and divine beings, really look like fang deities, and are quite jarring, especially imagine if you had come there as a Christian. Imagine walking up to a temple, another example to add, and you see a whole series of swastikas with a whole bunch of creatures that look actually like demons. Now one, you would, uh, if you had a gut reaction to this, I think in some ways that's, that's to be understood. But you're not really looking at demons and a symbol that we associate with Nazi Germany. <laughs> you're actually looking at a symbol and divine beings who are showing forth showing forth, sorry, if you will, the ferocity and defensive capacity of the divine order of Dharma. Um, um, I remember, actually, I lived in Yemen with my wife, and we taught English there. And I remember I was talking to many of my, many of my students, who are Muslim, and I remember one day they were actually discussing Buddhism. And they actually said, you know, but in the end, Buddhism could never actually be a divine religion. It is, it is only error, because... You know, they, 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 they pray to like a tooth or like, you know, like a rock. And they're talking, for example, of relics of the Buddha, right? And they're also talking about, uh, if you will, uh, statues of the Buddha. And I said, well, one, that may not actually have been the original intent uh, uh, of Buddhism. Yet at the same time, like, I, I can empathize. I can truly empathize with this. Uh, because I know this other religion, it's very peculiar to me as well for the same reason, because all of them, really, like the entire community of this religion, uh, literally like bow down to like a, a cube of rock with like a black stone in the side of it. 
And obviously, they sort of jumped up and got startled. And I said, "Yeah, they're called Muslims. They play like a like a like a rock chunk building." And I'm speaking of the Kaaba in Mecca. Uh, and I'm smiling, <laughs> and I have a good relationship with these people. And of course, they get, "No, no, teacher, that's that, that's not actually what we mean. What we're doing, we're not actually playing praying to the rock." And I said, "Yeah, and I don't actually think Buddhists are actually." praying to that statue. I don't think Hindus are praying to that statue. I think it is being used as a symbol and a representation of some spiritual truth, some covenant, some relationship um, that you yourself are doing when you pray five times towards the Kaaba and Mecca. It's once again that we can actually have a functional similarity with a surface radical difference. Um, this is another example quickly was I'm, once I was sitting with my wife and a friend of ours, and this individual said to me, um, I don't believe in judgment. I believe in karma. And I said, I don't think those are quite as different as you might believe. Because in each case, now we, we won't go into karma judgment here today, but I said, you have to understand that in each of these cases, there is a moral order, a moral order unto which you are held accountable under which you are judged against, and which the ramifications of one's behavior are then meted out upon the individual that actually did them. No matter what concept one might have of anatman, no self within Buddhism, it is not someone else who actually has, if you will, the ramifications of the consequences of their own karma. Um, no matter what your view in Hinduism, in karma, there is a moral order that you are actually held and judged against, and the consequences of that act are meted out from the moral order of creation. And I would suggest that why one might see this as radically different than judgment in Christianity, when we begin to try to hash out what those symbols, what those stories are trying and attempting to communicate to us, that they're not remotely as different as most people think. This brings uh, us to another principle, which is I call the principle of intelligent reading or literal versus non-literal. So I really, really, really believe that taking religious texts literally in their most obvious and physical manifestation is not taking them seriously. That we have to understand as best we can uh, from original languages and internal definition in their evolutionary context, what this story may be attempting to tell us or convey to us. And I would suggest that Plato's cave, the idea of the cave and the archetypes and the forms, excuse me, that Plato shares, where individuals are tied in a cave with a rock wall behind them and they can't turn their heads and there's a fire beyond it where people parade these clay figurines and we only see the shadows. And that we have to, as Plato tells us, escape our chains and get out of the cave to see the true forms because we're only seeing the shadows, say, of, you know, like a clay figurine of a horse. And when we can perceive the platonic forms, we will see what a horse really looks like and understand this. Um, I would suggest Plato in no way remotely is attempting to convey to us that we are actually literally and physically chained to a rock in a cave with a rock wall and a fire beyond us. Uh, he is attempting to convey, to share with us philosophical concepts and is actually utilizing the principle of metaphor analogy to share those ideas with us I would even propose because he has no other choice. Um, we're going to be doing a talk on symbolism and philosophical encrustation in symbols in the future, but for now I would charge anyone to try to actually spend a day looking at their own language, because you can't look at your own language, physically speaking, and tr see how much of one's own language is actually shared through physical concepts. And to see how you could convey as an exercise the ideas enshrined within Plato's cave without using metaphor and analogy. It would be a really, really good process. So I myself, when I look at these divine revelations, I do not take 
for example, them to be merely expressing actual historical truth, but are rather using the only means we have, which is language, and the best means possible, which is metaphor, symbolism, and analogy, to convey deep philosophical and spiritual truths about ourselves, and about God, and about reality in general. Um, it is through this, I, another quick example, I do not believe that Charles Dickens, in writing A Christmas Carol, is attempting to tell us that there are ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, but that A Christmas Carol is actually sharing ideas of profound truth through the metaphor of these ghosts, of the life of Ebenezer Scrooge, and is trying to give us understandings of what is important. There's just a quick example to think on. Um, for now, here's a quote from Abdu'l-Baha. Our Father will not hold us responsible for the rejection of dogmas, which we are unable either to believe or comp comprehend. For he is ever infinitely just to his children. So we're not held responsible for the rejection of dogmas that we cannot comprehend. This doesn't as absolve us of the duty to investigate. Um, we have that duty as well. So that's why I bring this up in the context of the value of names and symbolism and intelligent reading. Uh, we can't look at something like Jesus Christ telling us eat his flesh and drink his blood and go, that's out. That's ridiculous, right? How can I eat his body? Uh, it's, we have the duty to investigate and try to understand this. Um, this next quote comes from Abdu'l Baha as well. All the texts and teachings of the Holy Testaments have intrinsic spiritual meanings. They are not to be taken literally. I therefore pray in your behalf that you may be given the power of understanding these inner real meanings of the Holy Scriptures and may become informed of the mysteries deposited in the words of the Bible so that you may attain eternal life and that your hearts may be attracted to the kingdom of God. May your souls be illumined by the light of the words of God and may you become repositories of the mysteries of God for no comfort is greater and no happiness is sweeter than spiritual comprehension of the divine teachings. So in this passage from the Propagation of Universal Peace, Abdu'l-Baha is telling us that all the texts and teachings of the Holy Testaments have spiritual meanings, intrinsic spiritual meanings, and we're not going to be taking them literally. Does this mean they contain no literal fact? No, it means that there are deeper meanings, and as it says, mysteries deposited in the words of the Bible. There is a beautiful aspect to this quote because at the end it says, for no comfort is greater, no happiness sweeter than spiritual comprehension of the divine teachings. That this is actually the greatest happiness and the sweetest things in our life. And we can be, begin to underlock and understand how these holy scriptures relate to our own selves and to human existence. On the concept of literality versus symbolic and figuratism, figuralism, <laughs> um, philosophical reading of scripture often appears to some uh, either as a betrayal, as if we're trying to you know, rip apart what it actually was trying to say, which was the literal and physical aspect, um, or just a reaction to uh, current secular or atheistic perspectives. Um, one, the first one, which is a betrayal, uh, I don't think it is at all, because it's tr treating these texts as if they are deep minds, rich with gems, about the real divine relationship between ourselves and God. Even if someone is actually wrong, even if I am wrong, I am actually treating the New Testament or the Buddhist scriptures as if they're actually divine texts. If I read, for example, just the story of Abraham, uh, as mere history, I can actually just check the boxes. Okay, I know what he did, that's it. And I can leave it. Whereas if I begin to try to understand, well, how is this actually a symbolic communication of something about my life or the, about the life of the nation of Israel about, or about the relationship of God and humankind or about my duties in a covenantal relationship to the divine world, then actually it's a mulling over and a retreating of 
that theme, that motif of the life of Abraham as trying to squeeze out of it the sweet juices that are enshrined therein. If I treat it merely as history, it's over. But this brings up something is that it's only through that story's meaning that it's one, its richness can emerge, but also that it can connect to my life. That it can communicate some garment of meaning, if you will, in my life. Because if it is only history, it actually has no relationship to my life. That was Abraham's life. It is only when I see the resurrection, for example, of Jesus Christ as a meaning for my own life and the rejuvenation and resurrection of my dead self into a true living self in the light of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, no matter how you read that phrase, that it begins to take on its own meaning in the life of the adherent. Um, this again will be a uh, presentation we'll be looking at far more deeply in the future when we look at symbolism, myth, and meaning. Divine things are too deep to be expressed by common words. The heavenly teachings are expressed in parable in order to be understood and preserved for ages to come. When the spiritually minded dive deeply into the ocean of their meaning, they bring to the surface the pearls of their inner significance. There is no greater pleasure than to study God's Word with a spiritual mind. So here again in, in Abdu'l-Baha in London, we are told divine things are too deep to be expressed um, by common words. So they are given in parable to be understood and preserved for ages to come. That when the spiritually minded begin to actually look at them, we can actually pull out the meanings and significances enshrined therein, and that once again there is no greater pleasure than to study God's word with a spiritual mind. At this point we're going to actually jump out, but I would recommend to any of the listeners or the viewers to actually read the talk by Abdu'l-Baha, uh, Intelligible Realities and Their Expression Through Sensible Forms, found in some answered questions. Um, or Paristock, sorry. Now, I will put it within the PDF version that is actually accessible in the description of this video. But we're going to move to another principle here, which I just say, call the, the believer does not take precedent. Now, what is this attempting to convey? Simply that the adherent of a religion does not have some more intrinsic authority on the meaning of a scripture or a doctrine uh, it is that we all have the text. This is the principle of textual empiricism from a different vantage point. Uh, no a Christian assumes that the Jews' view of the Old Testament takes precedent. No Buddhist assumes that the Hindu expression of the Vedic pantheon, the gods and the Vedas, must necessarily take precedent over the view of a Buddhist and their understanding of these divine realities through the Buddhist scriptures. Uh, no scholar of Marxism assumes <laughs> that the Marxist believer actually has the sole authority over what Marx meant. They can be wrong. Nor the student of Darwin, right, assume the Darwinian takes precedence. In each of these cases, it is that these are uh, literature and scriptures that we can actually study to understand. And if someone in front of me who says they are the true believer of this tells me that's not what it means, I don't care. I will listen and do my best to try to understand how they see it and take that into account when I'm reading that text. But at the same time, they do not take precedent. Another aspect of this principle I call your priest their monk, which is if you're going to actually investigate something, give it the benefit of the doubt and seek out the most intelligent representation of that belief system. This really came home to me in my own search and investigations when I was in my early, early 20s. I used to go to a coffee shop in my hometown and actually would get into debates, uh, dialogue and debates, with a group of evangelical Christians. And one day as I left the coffee shop, after a rather long and intense debate with them, 
I was looking out over the river in my hometown, and if you will, sort of like congratulating myself on how all that went, when something dawned on me that changed the way I viewed investigation uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, it was that I came from a very small town, and I had been debating these individuals and criticizing Christianity for years and years and years. And I always seemed to do very well against my peers and against, say, this group of evangelical Christians from the other side of the town. <laughs> and yet I knew several priests and pastors within my home community. And with my objections and my questions, I had never, ever gone to them. I had never gone to Father Maglio at the Catholic Church at St. Francis downtown and said, these are the problems that I actually have with Christianity. What do you say? I did not bring them to an intelligent or potentially intelligent response to this issue. I took my beliefs and my understandings and I kept them to myself because I thought these were good arguments that I could defend myself from my Christian friends. Why I said this changed me is because as I began to study comparative religion, I would find, for example, that I had heard things about Buddhism that were not true. That I had heard things about Islam that just weren't true. That I had heard things about Christianity and reasons I had rejected Christianity that were not biblical. This is the principle of empirical textual, uh, sorry, textual empiricism. So when you're actually investigating some of these issues, it is to actually seek the best answer you can in your avenue of approach for investigating the unity of religion. This relates, of course, just like the believer doesn't talk, take precedent, that the majority does not, excuse me, that the majority does not rule. That to say the majority of Christians or Muslims view, for example, this text or this doctrine in this certain way um, is not an argument. It is just simply a truth, if it is a truth, that many people within this community see this issue this way. But of course, every astronomer could believe in an Earth-centered solar system and be wrong. This is just a simple principle of critical thinking. That to say, but Christians believe X. Well, there's two problems. One is that doesn't necessarily mean that that is actually a true representation of Christianity. Um, I can take it into account and I can, again, seek out their priest or their monk and try to understand as best I can from that community what their best argument is for that idea but I'm not going to allow the majority to rule me. The principle of richness, simply put, is that we often forget how rich each of these communities is in their perspectives and different groups within them. I might be talking to a friend and they say, well, you know, that's not, that isn't Christianity. But at the same time, I actually know that it is a position of the Greek Orthodox Church. But they themselves are Pentecostal. Or they might say, well, you know, that's not, that, that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you know, what, we, what Christianity teaches is X or Y. And I'll say, it, it is true that that is a position of the Catholic Church. Uh, it is not a Lutheran position, and I would suggest that they are Christian. How a, how a Sunni, for example, views Islam is not identical to a, if you will, 12-er Shia, or an Ismaili. Um, there, there are very rich communities here, and oftentimes we make these different religions uh, a monolithic structure, as if they all believe one thing. But they have a process of interpretation that is often very particular to each of the communities. Someone might say, well, that's not Buddhism. What they really mean is that is not the position of two writers that they have read within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So to say that that's not Buddhism, well, it might be Pure Land Buddhism, or it might be Nishiren Buddhism. <laughs> it might actually be something that is explicitly taught within the Pali Canon, but to say that this is not Buddhist uh, is, is an error. 
Um, and the only way we can solve is to try and do our best as human beings to look at the original scriptures, try to understand them free of their historical interpretation, explore them as deeply as we can, right? And do our best to try and give them an intelligent reading and a coherent reading, if you will. Um, so this brings us once again to this issue of what I would call the non-neutrality principle. We all have access to the same scriptures. We all have access to the same universe. The Catholic perspective isn't the neutral perspective on Christianity. Neither, for that matter, is a Calvinist perspective. Um, nor is the current rabbinical tradition, nor is the current Shia position or the Zaidi position, or the Ismaili position, or any of the schools of Sunni thought. <laughs> we are each taking a look at these different scriptures and this universe together, and trying to understand what they are and what they mean, be they scriptural, textual, or even physical realities within our universe. And the question is actually, which interpretation? And we'll explore that for a second. Oftentimes it is stated that I am looking at a Christianity through a Baha'i perspective. And that is actually the obscuring view, which leads me to erroneously understand that revelation. I've had it told to me by Buddhists that it is actually because I'm looking at Buddhism from a Baha'i perspective that I am not interpreting properly. And that theirs is the neutral position from where we must begin. But if we understand, one, that there is a scripture that we can all look at, and then it's undeniable that there is a richness to many of these traditions, varying views within it, varying interpretations, and that we can look at the original scripture, look at their original language, and that it actually might be the Orthodox, in this case, let's say, the Tibetan Buddhist position, that is actually what is obscuring how do we then actually move through this, if you will, swamp or morass of different interpretations and understandings of these scriptures? There is no ultimate neutral position. No Christian would say, they would want to say, for example, that the Christian position is the neutral position on the Bible, but don't want to say that it is actually the Jewish position that is actually the neutral position on the Old Testament. They want to make their position the neutral position, if you will, on how the Old Testament should be read, it, read, sorry, even though that's not how Jews read it. So what do we do? I think the question is which understanding of these different scriptures really genuinely takes the text into account. Are we being honest? Are we really investigating the text? Are we abiding by textual empiricism and being wary both of the orthodox and the unorthodox? Is our presentation of, for example, this text, our understanding of it, is it make this text logically consistent? Is it a honest, intelligent reading of the text itself? Does it shed light on for future problems or other problems? Meaning is, not only is it taking the actual empirical structure into account, uh, is it not self-contradictory? right? Uh, logically consistent. But also at the same time, is it fruitful? Does our understanding of this text or this section or this part of the scripture shed light on another? Is it fruitful in opening up, if you will, the scripture in an intelligent and rational way? Um, does it cohere with the world we experience? Does it really, really gel with the physical reality and the nature of reality that we see in our everyday life, the actual world we experience before we've chopped it up for philosophical neatness, if you will. Um, does it offer an interpretation of, say, this passage or understanding of the scripture? Does it offer a simple and elegant understanding of this dispensation, of this book, of this concept? Does it unify our understanding of our world? Does it take disparate phenomena and bring them together into a way that we can see them as a collective whole, as opposed to just broken off pieces? Um, 
I think one of the things that's important to notice is that these are actually the values in the philosophy of science of any good scientific theory. <laughs> that we're trying to say, okay, we have all these disparate views, there's all these different theories, but which one is going to not be self-contradictory, which one takes the text, the empirical world into account, the actual external world into account, is it fruitful? Does it unify our understanding? Does it actually shed light on other problems? Uh, does it prive, provide, sorry, a set of heuristics? Uh, a way for solving problems, if you will. Does it give us a series of principles that enable us to solve issues in our world? Um, can it withstand attempts at refutation? This is another aspect, again, of the principles of any good scientific theory that we actually have to look at. If we actually start throwing things at it in an attempt to refute it, does it withstand, withstand those attacks? Does it, for example, lead to future research? Does it open up avenues of investigation that we wouldn't have thought of before and new ways to look at old phenomenon? Um, I will repeat once again, <laughs> this is, these are the fundamental principles that we look for in guiding us for the investigation of a scientific theory. Does it take the empirical world into account? This includes the text. Is it logically consistent? Is it fruitful? And I would even put in here, it's technology. In this case, it would be the social technology of the religion in question. Does it cohere with the world we experience? Does it unify? Does it offer a simple, elegant explanation? Does it provide a way to deal with future problems we haven't encountered? Can withstand attempts at refutation? And does it lead to future research? So when you're looking at an understanding of a dispensation, of an understanding of a philosophical worldview, this is what you're looking for. The same goes when you're looking at a religious perspective, and this includes a perspective of religious unity and in individual problems. So when you're looking at, for example, the issue of, say, the Trinity as it's represented by the Christian community, and the problems that arise when one reads the Quran, can we have an intelligent reading of the New Testament, an intelligent reading of the Quran? Can we look at original languages? Can we bring them together to investigate? Yes, we can. And if we find that that actually provides an intelligent, fruitful, logically consistent, unifying perspective, that unifies disparate phenomenon, and we grant it an intelligent reading as opposed to choosing the lowest rung, well, maybe that actually is a mark of truth because it's a mark of truth in other areas. Rather than babble more on this, we'll have a quote. It is imperative that we should renounce our own particular prejudices and superstitions if we earnestly desire to seek the truth. Unless we make a distinction in our minds between dogma, superstition, and prejudice on the one hand, and truth on the other, we cannot succeed. When we are in earnest in our search for anything, we look for it everywhere. This principle we must carry out in our search for truth. It means also that we must be willing to clear away all that we have previously learned, all that would clog our steps on the way to truth. We must not shrink, if necessary, from beginning our education all over again. We must not allow our love for any one religion or any one personality to so blind our eyes that we become fettered by superstition. When we are freed from all these bonds, seeking with liberated minds, then shall we be able to arrive at our goal. So this quote on Inventive Advanced Negation of Truth, as we're nearing the end of our study, is important to understand, and to try to inculcate into our lives. Yes, it's challenging, but the ideal is not one that really can be denied. Because once again, any person from any community would ask that of a member of the community outside, to put aside their prejudices, to actually look with fresh eyes to see maybe if actually can be seen in a different light. I ask that of you, and you would ask it of me. The Jew thinks the Christian should do this, the Christian thinks the Jew should do this, the Baha'i thinks the Muslim, and the Muslim the Baha'i. An atheist thinks a Christian should do this, a New Ager thinks an atheist should do this. Um, it's something that we have to be, be very aware of and when we undertake this 
perspective or process of avenues of approach to seek out truth. This last section I call backfires, blowbacks, and boomerangs. Um, it's strange because people often object to a concept in a foreign tradition that is similar to one in their own, or accept arguments from members of their own community but deny the same argument if presented by someone else. I want to give one example. Um, a very, if you will, controversial claim or perspective put forward by Baha'is and very upsetting and understandably upsetting to the Christian community is that Jesus Christ has returned in the person of Baha'u'llah. Of course, it's important to know that it is equally as upsetting to a Christian talking to a Jew claiming that the Messiah was Jesus Christ who came 2,000 years ago or if it was said in his day that he came three months ago. <laughs> um, but one of the most, and a very understandable retort, is that this cannot be because it is the return of Jesus Christ. Not the return of somebody else with a different name. And this individual that you refer to by is as Baha'u'llah, we know when he was born, who he was born to, he grew up, became a man. So he cannot be the return of Jesus Christ. I remember having a very, and it was a very loving conversation with a Christian friend of mine, and I said, it was a long relationship, and I said, it's difficult because if I accept that principle, that it is impossible that Baha'u'llah could be the return of Jesus Christ, and yet have come from the womb of someone and have been grown up, I wouldn't have to reject just the Baha'i faith, I would have to reject Christianity. Um, he found this surprising, and he asked me why I would say such a thing. And I said, because in the New Testament, and I ask you to investigate this, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, was claimed by Jesus Christ to be Elijah, an Old Testament prophet who had lived over a thousand years prior. The Jews, which occurs at the end of the book of Malachi, are waiting for the coming of Elijah before the great and terrible day of God. John the Baptist was born and grew up, and his name was John. And then he actually starts preaching the coming kingdom of God. When the disciples finally understand Jesus Christ to be the Messiah, he is asked, but is, are we told that Elijah was supposed to come first? And he says, if you will hear it, or if you will receive it, Elijah has come, and they knew that he was talking about John the Baptist. So either an individual can return and be the same individual in some sense, and this is explored within Baha'u'llah's writings, and yet have been born of a womb and grown up, or else Elijah cannot be John the Baptist, and thus Elijah didn't come, and therefore Jesus Christ cannot be the Messiah. I bring this up because this is a backfire. Um, <laughs> you might see, for example, this is very odd as a Christian looking at the by faith, but not have noticed that this is very odd from a Jewish perspective when they look at Christianity. Another example, quickly, uh, oftentimes I've had in the wonderful conversations with brothers and sisters here uh, from the Christian faith, the question of war in Islam. But what is peculiar is, is they have never had an issue with war within the Old Testament. Some of them have, but others, it had never actually been considered that that would have to be answered as much as that in Islam would have to be answered. Or even for someone who doesn't believe in any book, whether or not they believe war is ever just. And it's something to actually really be concerned with. Um, this is why often um, we hear this principle voiced within the Baha'i writings. The first is from the Tablet of Ahmed. O oh people, if you deny these verses, by what proof have you believed in God? Likewise, in the verse concerning the Spirit, he saith, And they will ask thee of the Spirit, say, The Spirit proceedeth at my Lord's command. 
As soon as Muhammad's answer was given, they all clamorously protested, saying, Lo, an ignorant man who knoweth not what the Spirit is, calleth himself the revealer of divine knowledge. And now behold the divines of the age who, because of their being honored by his name, and finding that their fathers have acknowledged his revelation, have blindly submitted to his truth. Observe, were this people today to receive such answers in reply to such questionings, they would unhesitatingly reject and denounce them. Nay, they would again utter the self-same cavils, even as they have uttered them in this day. So in the first quote from Baha'u'llah, it says, O oh, people, if you deny these verses, by what proof have you believed in God? So it's saying, okay, well, if you deny, I'll use the example of Elijah, if you deny that an individual can be the same individual in some spiritual sense, it said the spirit and power of Elijah, for example, in the New Testament, and yet um, it cannot be in this case, um, by what proof have you believed in the New Testament? If you don't believe that's possible, how can you accept the New Testament in its response to the Jew? If you do not believe that there could be a case in which a prophet, who is the head of state of a group of individuals, who he actually has to protect, protect and it will be attempting to be exterminated by local tribes and groups, <laughs> this is the case of the Prophet Muhammad, if you do not believe that in such a case that individual when we resort to defensive warfare to protect the community, how do you answer the conquest of Canaan in the Old Testament? How do you answer some of the actions of the individuals within the Old Testament, which you yourself believe to be scriptural? How do you, for example, understand as a Hindu then, if you made the same objection to Islam, how do you understand the opening of the Bhagavad Gita? Wherein Arjuna does not wish to fight in a battle. For anyone who isn't aware, the Bhagavad Gita, a central Hindu text, takes place in the context of a battlefield, where Arjuna does not want to fight, but he actually is a warrior caste, and is supposed to be defending the community. How do you understand as a Hindu why that is acceptable, and if a similar thing is happening in the case of Islam, that is unacceptable? This gives us the understanding, if you will, of both of these cases. If you accept an argument in the case of the Spirit, Right? Um, were this people today to receive answers and reply to such questionings, they would unhesitatingly reject and denounce them. But they have accepted the same kinds of ideas, the same kinds of arguments from their forefathers. Another example, quickly passing to throw out there, is that oftentimes I have individuals who will accept arguments about the existence, the real existence, of mathematical objects. Yet when the exact same argument is presented for the existence of moral properties, they seem to suddenly spin. One it proves and the other it does disproves. This is, if you will, this issue of backfires, blowbacks, and boomerangs. They come back. This also relates to another issue, which I call the principle of nearness. There's a lot of issues, <laughs> a lot of principles here. Um, whereas oftentimes, I've had the experience of hearing just a beautiful, beautiful exposition or understanding of some scripture or some philosophical concept from a very wonderful, wonderful mind, say, within the Islamic community or within the Christian community. And yet, if I said that same argument, I am seen as being heretical or completely unorthodox. And it's important once again, in the context of the principle of richness, there are some very, very exalted and intelligent and brilliant minds in each of these traditions that have proposed ways of understanding that own tradition, say a Christian to the New Testament, or a Jew to the, the Tanakh, or for example, a Muslim to the Quran, which is actually a brilliant and beautiful exposition that is, this individual is seen as a pillar of the community, but if you voiced that position, to many laymen, it's not accepted. So it's, an, it's a wonderful exploration to understand these different traditions, to actually seek out their great minds, their priest, their monk. But at the same time, 
you get a, an, a, a sense of the richness of these dispensations, but also a sense of how close the bridges can be built from each side. Then at some times when we really are really open about the scripture and open about our own communities, uh, if you will, academics, that bridge can become very, very, very close, or it's a mere hop to, to if you will, unify two worldviews. There's just a few final principles to throw out quickly, and this one is preaching to our choirs. A note on honesty, and it is this. Too often we accept very bad arguments from people who agree with us. Too often. <laughs> and it is important for the intellectual epistemological evolution of our own communities to be able to lovingly disagree with each other and lovingly and respectfully question each other within our own communities. Um, and that once we see that an argument is not valid or does not support the conclusion we wished, we should, in that in independent investigation of truth, put it aside, rejoice, and be willing to share a better answer with someone. This is very important with our own communities, but it's also important across communities. For example, if I were a Christian and I said that it is not that Baha'u'llah could be, is the return of Christ, but if I had said it is impossible that Baha'u'llah could be the return of Christ because his name was Mirza Hussein Ali and he was born in Iran. And then I actually have a Baha'i share with me the fact that, well, maybe Baha'u'llah is in the return of Christ, uh, that might actually be true. That might, He might not be. At the same time, it is important to note that John the Baptist was Elijah and yet had been born of a womb recently and people had watched him grow up. So we know that that can happen, so it's obviously possible. Uh, it doesn't mean Baha'u'llah is the return of Christ, but it is possible that it could be. And he could be Jesus Christ and yet at the same time have been born recently from a womb, from a woman in Iran. <laughs> um, that when I hear that, not only is it important that I myself take hold of it, it's also very important that if I am in a room, this is the note on honesty part, and I hear one of my Christian brothers say, well, Baha'u'llah can't be the return of Christ, because he's not Christ, his name isn't Jesus, and this man, Baha'u'llah, was born Mirza Hussein Ali Nuri, in 1817, so he can't possibly be. If I am not merely in, interested in preaching to the choir, if I'm really on a path of independent investigation of truth, and I want to be intellectually honest, I should say to my Christian brother, you know, I don't believe actually Baha'u'llah is who he said so either. The one thing I do know is that this argument doesn't work. Because were to I accept this, I would have to claim that it would be impossible that John the Baptist was Elijah, and I would have to take Jesus Christ as lying in the New Testament, and that a prophecy had failed. And he might say, yes, but Jesus, you know, Baal is not the return of Christ, and I could say honestly, I don't think so either. I think there's other problems. But just to be honest, among ourselves, it does not do us well, it does not serve truth to represent it with falsity. And the truth never needs this. So let us investigate other ways that, for example, Baha'u'llah is not the return of Christ. But this one does not lead anywhere. This is what I would call the preaching to the choir on the one hand, because I'm questioning my brother or my sister as she represents this, but at the same time a note of honesty. I myself don't believe that to be true. This is why I often say to Baha'i friends that it's important that we begin to really learn how to disagree gracefully, lovingly, and to accept that as a part of a consultation and put aside what we thought was a good argument or a truth and rejoice that we have found something new. The principle of the isolated objection. Imagine you're discussing the seal of the prophets, which is the doctrine or the dogma, or I believe, within Islam that there can be no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad. Just imagine, for the sake of discussion, that you actually have solved that. And you can present it in a way that a person can understand, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, there actually could be. 
Very often what occurs in our avenues of approach and dialogue is that someone will say, yeah, but Baha'u'llah says, you know, he says he's God and he gets rid of Islamic law, so he can't be. This is again a note on intellectual honesty and a principle of isolating objections. I would say, okay, pause for a second. Once again, Baha'u'llah can be completely false, just like with Elijah and John the Baptist. And at the same time, the Islamic community's understanding of the seal of the prophets can also be false. These are isolated issues. So maybe, for example, there really and truly is a conscious, for the, to the degree to which we can say that, moral fabric underlying the universe. And that that moral, whatever you want to call it, actually represents itself to humankind and communicates ways that humankinds can interact and should interact with each other. And that the moral order behind the universe includes moral and conceptual truths to which men, humankind, are held accountable unto. And that that sounds very much like God, and that is completely represented within Buddhist scripture. That it is a functional definition I have no problem with. And then a person says to me, say from the Buddhist community, or someone who just knows about Buddhism, well, nevertheless, Doc, the Buddhism teaches the doctrine of no self, the doctrine of Anatman. I can easily say, yeah, and maybe I am completely and utterly wrong about Anatman, but that is a different topic. That is a different issue. It is an isolated objection. But we could have something that looks very much like a god, that is communicative, that actually represents itself to humankind, that gives a path to actually draw oneself out of the quagmire of this world towards the divine worlds, and that that sounds very much like the God that I personally read within the New Testament, or the Quran, and the doctrine of no self just kills it. That's over. So we have to try to understand, if you will, that the, for example, the doctrine of resurrection, which from the Baha'i perspective to the Christian perspective might seem very different. And if I actually begin to solve this issue, very often in my own interactions, as this begin to really try and understand each other better, and that the Christian sees that I don't see it the way they think I see it, and we come closer and closer together, I'll suddenly have, yeah, but there's no way, right? Uh, there's no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. I can say, Maybe you're right, but at the same time, maybe we don't have this problem, this issue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This brings us finally to the last principle, and thank you for spending time with me, um, that we're going to have to dedicate another section to, an actual entire one or two series, which is that of the divine assayer. It is actually how and why God tests humankind why and how we are brought towards claims and we are always presented a way out. We are always presented a way we can object, reject, and turn away. And it's that the underlying principle of it all is that goals that are worthwhile don't come for free. If I wish to actually have a serene mind, I have to train it. Genuinely train it through meditation, through prayer, through watching my mind, through breathing. It comes with a price. But this is the same if I actually want to have big muscles and a, a strong physique. I actually have to train it, I have to sweat, I have to push. There's a sacrifice involved. If I want to study a new language, if I want to understand archaeology, if I want to have a good grasp of history, if I want to learn the violin, if I want to learn a martial art, any of these come with a price. And there's always a reason not to train, not to practice, not to read. There's always a reason to turn aside on many of these routes. You will always find one. But it's an important thing to understand about the nature of the reality in which we live, that it is a gym, not a spa. And the things of great worth demand sacrifice and time and work. And I think in the future we will look at how God has the same principle that we see operating everywhere at work within the divine religions. 
that really and truly, we don't have to see the unity of religion. We don't have to see the truth or the reality of God or of his messengers. But we can if we're willing to put in an independent investigation, which is based upon and necessitates the entertaining of the possibility that maybe all these colors are different expressions of the same underlying phenomenon. Maybe the underlying phenomenon actually exists that unites all the elements of the periodic table. That a gas is made up of the same thing of a solid or a liquid. Maybe we can really begin to entertain the possibility that we all have a common biological ancestor, but we're going to have to do research in any of these areas to find out if they're true. And maybe that's true for the unity of religion, and I hope some of these avenues of approach have shed some light on how I myself as an individual might perceive that. Thank you.